Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, so it must be time for the next installment of the Freightland Biomedical Research Institute Pioneers in Biomedical Research Seminar Series. Uh, before getting on to the introductions for today's speaker, I just want to give everybody a heads up and reminder for next week's seminar. Same time, same station. Uh, next week, we'll have Dr. Katarina Akasoglo uh, from the Gladstone Institute and a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. And she will be talking about neurovascular interactions, mechanisms, imaging, and therapeutics. So again, welcome to everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to now introduce uh, the introducer for today's speaker who will introduce Dr. Hurd, our own Dr. Reed Montague. Reed, go ahead and take it away. Hi, I'm Reed Montague here at the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute. And it is my distinct privilege to introduce Dr. Yasmin Hurd um, today. Um, Dr. Hurd is a professor of psychiatry, neuroscience, and pharmacological science at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where she also serves as a Ward Coleman Chair in Translational Neuroscience, the Director of the Center of Addictive Disorders and the Director of the Addiction Institute. Her accomplishments uh, precede her and are vast, so I will only touch some of the high points as I deem them. Dr. Hurd is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, an elected member of the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, um, and is the recent recipient of a, another award, which I won't mention, which I particularly find um, pleasing to see as a, as a colleague, a longtime colleague of hers. Just to um, add to this, um, she's been involved in the extension of neuroscience to the public domain, both in terms of public communication, serving on important committees, and redefining really what we think are important problems here. Let me just touch on a few of her service related issues that I think on that. In 2002 to 2006, she was on the National Institute of Drug Abuse Board of Scientific Counselors, actually quite early in her career. She was part of the NIH uh, panel that set the blueprint for neuroscience research work group in 2006. From 2007 to 2011, she served on the MacArthur um, Law and Neuroscience Network, which spread the, which extended the idea of neuroscience data into the legal domain. That is now a vital and growing area. Um, from 2008 to 2014, she was the founding chair of the of Diversity and Biomedical Research Committee at Mount Sinai. She's been study section member um, throughout her career on and off on and various sorts of study sections and advisory councils. In 2010, she was the on the NIMH RDOT positive valence work group, redefining um, the way we're going to go after mental illness and recategorizing it, uh, a, a series of executive committees, et cetera. Uh, and in 2017 um, was the year where she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, which I mentioned earlier. So um, I'm quite enthusiastic about not just her work, but also her outreach and her impact on students and, and, and inspiring the next generation of students. So with that, I'd like to welcome Professor Yasmin Hurd. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, I love it. Thank you so much, Reed, for the invitation and for that really um, uh, very, very nice um, introduction. So today I'm going to let me get my slide. Um, uh, oops. So today I'm going to tell you in one sense about um, what we have learned um, about the impact of the developmental cannabis and actually where we're going. Um, in understanding its long-term impact relevant to psychiatric risk. Nothing I'm gonna talk about today has any, uh, any conflicts, except for you know, the, the debates that are happening in our society um, in regard to the potential risks and benefit of cannabis as cannabis, cannabis has become legal in, for medicinal or um, recreational use in many states. I'm going to start off the, you know, by emphasizing that our endogenous cannabinoid system really plays a critical role in new neurodevelopmental processes. I'm not going to go through all of them, but from um, early fetal development in terms of neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, throughout childhood, even in terms of programmed cell death, 
um, that you see during you know, early childhood and into adolescence and early adulthood where synaptic pruning and fine tuning of the neural circuits that are contributes even for the maturation of the prefrontal cortex. And very early people had um, seen that there are these long-term impact of developmental cannabis exposure, perhaps because it's impacting on the endocannabinoid system that, as I said, is really critical for um, neurodevelopment. And so one of the things that we have right now, which I kind of call the perfect storm in our society, um, it comes to the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, cannabis is now legal in, you know, many places. And so there's wide availability. And with that has come this aspect of reduced risk that cannabis is without any harm. At the same time that the THC concentrations in cannabis on the street and even in dispensaries have increased dramatically. You have from anywhere from 24 to even 80% um, THC. And we know the higher the THC concentration, the greater the impact on the brain, especially in relation to psychiatric um, risk. And a number of other events that really make young people think that, as I said, there's not much risk there. It's cheaper for them. Social media promotes, you know, how great it is. And so I call it the perfect storm for the developing um, brain and the vulnerable developing brain. And I'll start off with, you know, giving you some overview of where we started in terms of um, some of our earlier work in looking at um, prenatal exposure to cannabis, as well as adolescent exposure. And what do we see? So early, um, it's clear, as I said before, that the endocannabinoid system is uh, a, an important part of neurodevelopment. This image is just showing, for example, the expression of the cannabinoid receptors, the CB1 receptor, which is um, the receptor where THC binds, for example. And you can see that in the human fetal brain, this is mid-gestation, mid that early on, the cannabinoid receptor is expressed in areas, for example, in the nucleus accumbens, this ventral striatal area, or the amygdala and, and hippocampus. And these are brain regions, obviously, as we all know, important for limbic um, uh, function. And a number of research studies have clearly defined the role of the endocannabinoid system in the hard wiring of the brain. So the cannabinoid receptors, they are localized to like axonal tracts and regulate, for example, neurite um, development. We, we had even seen that, you know, key players um, that are regulated by THC when exposure to THC occurs during the prenatal time period, it impacts on these microtubal proteins that are critical for axonal um, guidance and so on. So it's implicated in not only cytoskeletal dynamics, but synaptic plasticity. And we could see that not only THC, but in, importantly, we could translate this to the human condition. So in studying um, human fetal brains from um, mother, whose mothers um, use cannabis, um, we could see that similarly, sorry, similarly, um, there was an impact of cannabis decreasing this uh, microtubule um, protein and gene, which was, I didn't say statin 2, for example, um, in brain areas such as a striatum and hippocampus. So we could translate um, what we saw in animal models to humans. So we know the impact of cannabis in humans related to THC. Importantly, early in our studies, we could see that um, genes and neural systems that have been highly implicated in psychiatric vulnerability, especially addiction vulnerability, such as the dopaminergic system and the dopamine D2 receptor here, for example, that uh, again, um, fetuses whose mothers smoked cannabis, um, they showed decreased D2 expression in their nucleus accumbens. We see that also in, um, in another limbic brain area, for example, the amygdala. And even this early time period, we could see that there's a sex difference. So for example, males here um, show um, a much lower dopamine D2 in the amygdala as compared to fe females. An important question when we study humans is, you know, um, what's the specificity of the neurobiological findings to cannabis? And importantly, do any of the impact that of the developmental exposure to cannabis or THC 
lasts into adulthood and behavior. So, you know, is it important? And we could replicate using animal models a number of the things, as I said, that we saw in the human fetuses. For example, I told you about the statin 2, the microtubule um, protein, but also the dopamine D2 gene. So um, during prenatal development, just like the fetal brain, we could see that dopamine D2 was decreased in the accumbens. And it remained um, reduced even into adulthood. We replicated a number of other genes. I'm not gonna go through the detail of that. It was just really to emphasize that on the gene expression level, we could replicate the things that we saw in the human, um, human fetuses. Importantly, we could also show that there's a functional um, relevance to the a prenatal exposure to THC that in adults, even electrophysiologically, the cell firing in the striatum, here there is impaired long-term depression um, in the uh, adult brain. So there's a long-term impact and it replicates what we see in the human fetuses. But what about behavior? So one of the things for us, um, my, my research group, we focus on uh, vulnerability, for example, to addiction later in life. And we know that the opioid and cannabinoid system shares a lot of signaling um, uh, pathways. And so we looked at does prenatal exposure impact not only the molecular changes that we saw, but behaviors relevant to, for example, addiction and in particular the opioids. And so here we, we allowed animals to self-administer heroin themselves. And we could see that um, that animals with uh, adult animals with prenatal THC mm -hmm. exposure increased their heroin self-administration behavior. Um, and even when we chose doses that they should could show comparable self-administration of heroin, the adult animals that had the prenatal exposure basically ran to the lever to get their first hit of heroin. And we could see that under conditions of mild stress or anything that there was a greater increase of drug seeking behavior in these adult animals. So I'm, I'm uh, summarizing a lot of work just to say that, you know, prenatal cannabis exposure or THC, and we could put it to THC, really leads to protracted disruptions in adult behavior. I didn't show you the neural morphology chains, but the physiologically and in gene expression, and often a lot of them related to changes in synaptic plasticity. So when we were looking at all of these long-term effects um, in using our animal model, I still wanted to get back to, can we really look at this also in humans? Can we actually see um, what's the long-term impact of that in utero um, experience and look across the lifetime? And as you all know, that's pretty challenging because that's why we use animal models. We can study their life in a much shorter time period. And However, I have a phenomenal colleague, Yoko Nomura, and Yoko had been masochistic, even more masochistic than I am perhaps, and had been looking at stress um, effects in women who were pregnant on their offspring. And her project was, we call the Stress in Pregnancy Project, the SIP project. But once, and one thing happened is that, you know, obviously many women have different stresses during pregnancy, but in 2012, we have this really horrible hurricane in New York, in the, well, throughout the country and, and into the um, East Coast in the Superstorm Sandy. And as you can probably see, a lot of um, Manhattan and a lot of, well, you can't see on the other side, Queens was um, underwater. It was a very stressful event. And using that as one singular event, um, Yoko has been studying and, and, and I, not, us, not only stress, but cannabis also in, um, in, in women who uh, had um, been exposed to the Sandy Storm. And looking at their offspring, we've, um, we do yearly um, evaluations, we've taken you know, a lot of samples. And so one of the things for us was really the placenta. Could, the inv could we use the placenta as some sort of um, readout of the in utero environment that these kids were ex exposed to. And many people consider the, the placenta as a third brain, it's the link between the fetal and maternal brain. And my postdoc, Greg Rampala, we've been studying, looking at sequencing and studying the, the, the placenta of these women. And one of the things that was really um, interesting is not surprising perhaps that, that we see that the, the sandy storm stress experienced by these mothers changed 
changes the placental transcriptome. And where we see that it's changed here, well, you know, if you do um, uh, bioinformatics analysis, we see that the genes that are changed relate to the placenta, which is very good. Um, but what are they? So most of them are um, pregnancy specific glycoproteins. And these pregnancy specific glycoproteins actually related in large part to, for example, um, glucocorticoid um, metabolic processes, um, the jack step um, growth hormone signaling pathway, and also steroid biosynthesis. And it's important to emphasize that most of these, when we look at um, the transcription factor that regulates these, it was the glucocorticoid receptor. So again, perhaps not surprising, but what about cannabis? So cannabis exposure was um, quite, I, I, I guess we should have perhaps expected it, but I didn't expect it this much. We see this interesting reorganization of the transcriptome in relation to the immune system. And a number of the, oops, and a number of the genes have been um, well um, described in terms of immune function. But when, you, when we, we looked at the whole um, placenta and we wanted to, to see, are there specific cell populations that may give us some cell le cellular level insights? And what Greg could see is that the genes that are predominantly changed in relation to, to um, cannabis were related to this syntheotropo tropoblast cell population, and they're uniquely positioned at this maternal fetal interface. And they form this epithelial barrier for, you know, to the, mater the maternal um, pathogens and anti-host um, immunogenic and our anti-host immunogenic cells. And again, no matter how well, however we analyze them, um, we see that the, the, that there is this reduction in um, this, this, uh, with, with, with stress exposure. We also had the possibility to also look at gene expression in the striatum of the fetuses exposed to cannabis. And similar to what we had seen earlier in our earlier studies, we see that microtubule cytoskeletal um, uh, gene related um, uh, expression are changed. And then also that again, things related to immune, um, uh, the immune system are also changed in the striatum. But it's important to emphasize that there, there appears to be a double hit consequence of both prenatal cannabis and stress, both on the glucocorticoid receptor and on the cannabinoid receptor itself. So having both hits are, um, and has a negative um, impact for the, for the fetal, um, at least in the, in the placenta, in, the, in their environment. So we see the placental changes. And as I said, you know, we wanted to get a sense about, does this have any impact behaviorally that we can see in the offspring? And we have been studying the, the kids um, for a number of years now. And again, I'm not gonna give you um, um, a long litany of what we've seen, but it's imp interesting that when you look at steroid hormones in the children, there is higher levels of cortisol and DHEA in their hair. And, and this is when they're in, in childhood about years three and four. We also see that behaviorally, um, there's higher increase in anxiety and for example, an aggression in these kids with prenatal cannabis exposure. Importantly, when you look at their behaviors, we see that the placental immune gene networks actually are significantly associated with the high anxiety levels that these children express um, show later in life. Um, we can see in terms of the, cyto the cytokine signaling genes, they correlate with child anxiety. When we look at specific clinical, um, clinical measures of, of anxiety, again, genes associated with cannabis exposure during prenatal um, are those that have the high anxiety and are enriched in these immune, um, uh, immune pathways. And we can even start now to identify which gene, immune gene networks are predominantly enriched in relation to uh, maternal cannabis use and um, children with high anxiety. So we do know that maternal cannabis exposure and obviously the, the combination with traumatic stress 
really does alter, reorganizes the transcriptome, and it leads to these protracted effects that we can see in the offspring, both physiologically and behaviorally. And a lot of these behaviors, especially anxiety, are early um, predictors of, of um, the early onset of psychiatric and addiction, disorder, addiction risk. So, and I will just say, and we know that the can, cannabinoid system and in cannabis um, in particular does impact on both the stress and immune um, networks. So that's one thing that we are um, following up with a, a lot. So seeing the things in the children, I mean, we normally had studied, you know, looked at prenatal exposure to, um, to THC um, or cannabis and, and looked in adult animals, for example. But it's about looking at the progression throughout life. And so now seeing the, the human data, the question is, can we now go back in our animal models and start looking at an earlier time period, infancy, adolescence? And so just again, this is a quick um, overview of that, a postdoc, Anissa Farah, has been looking at the prenatal effects um, now starting earlier, and can we see anything during juvenile period? And indeed, when it, even one of the first um, uh, behaviors that we can study, we can see that, for example, ultrasonic vo um, vocalization is significantly um, changed in during um, juvenile period in, in rats. As they get older, social play comes into, to, we can see impairments in social play. We see uh, greater effects perhaps in, in males um, during that early adolescent period. And we've looked at a number of different behaviors and going get, getting into adulthood, we see that there's changes in motivation that's studied using progressive ratio in um, when animals have to um, choose either, you know, um, they press the lever once to get um, one reward here, it's chocolate, then they have to press uh, 10 times, 20 times to get that same um, one chocolate um, reward. And, and animals that had the prenatal exposure to THC, they will press much more for that, that one um, reward. We see similarly, depression-like um, phenotypes that looking at um, for swim tests, a, a behavioral model of despair that um, prenatal THC enhances depression-like phenotype and also changes the hedonic state um, here tested with sucrose intake where they show um, re um, uh, more depression-like behavior. So the question for me is like, so what is maintaining these long-term effects that yes, we can see prenatal effects on um, of THC and cannabis on the brain, placenta, but, and we can see these behavioral and molecular changes in, in the brains later in life. So what are the mechanisms that are maintaining this? And that's when we started looking at epigenetic mechanisms. And we looked, and as most many of you know, epigenetics is, you know, we inherit uh, the DNA sequence from our parents, that, and it's not that THC or cannabis um, produces mutations of your of your genetic um, DNA sequence, but what it can do is that um, epigenetic mechanisms in terms of DNA methylation, um, uh, histone modification modifications on these histone tails that changes the conformation of DNA, so it changes how genes are turned on and off, and so that's how the environment can regulate. Um, gene transcription and therefore um, protein changes. So what we did was to just look at a panel of epigenetic mechanisms, um, genes and um, enzymes and so on are important for that and to see what, um, it, what was most impacted by prenatal THC. And we could see that um, one gene kept on coming up. It's called KMT2A. And KMT2A which used to be called MLL1 mixed lineage leukemia because a lot of these epigenetic mechanisms have been studied first in, in um, the cancer field. But it's a histone methyl transferase that's really about transcriptional activation. And it's been shown to be very important for transcriptional memory. And we could see that animals as adults had changes in KMT2A throughout their lives, not only on the gene, the level of the gene, but also on the level of the protein. Importantly, we could go in and modulate the expression of KMT2A. For example, if you knock down the KMT2A gene in the cumbens, you can, you can normalize the, the impairment that we saw in motivated behaviors. So we know that there's a direct regulation. 
Um, we also wanted to see what does it, um, where does it impact, which genes it impacts throughout the genome. And we used, unfortunately, KMT2 aid was not great for, um, for chromatin immunoprecipitation to look at where uh, these epigenetic changes are bind in, in the genome, but it, it methylates the trimethylation of lysine 4. So we were able to look at where does it bind, what, what genes and, um, and what genes that is it really regulating. And perhaps again, not surprisingly, we see that in adults with um, prenatal TH exposure, the the KMT2A related epigenetic modifications on gene expression relates to this aspects of synaptic um, plasticity in terms of synaptic transmission, exogenesis, neuron projection morphogenesis, and so on. However, that's THC specific. And again, we just wanted to be able to see what is KMT2A really doing. And so we went to using a CRISPR um, strategy again with Anissa and um, overexpress using CRISPR and look at the where where is the core where there's where is there an overlap between the gene networks that are regulated by KMT2A and prenatal THC. And once again, it comes back to the synapse. The, the postsynaptic density, the neuron projection, these glutamatergic synapses. So we know um, now we're starting to identify the epigenetic um, regulation related to um, these protracted effects of prenatal um, cannabis exposure. And often they relate to um, impairments of synaptic um, transmission. So that's um, adolescent, the adolescent period so what about the next period that we know that um, the developing brain is exposed to cannabis and, is, and that's during adolescence. And we know that teens, they have reduced their, their um, smoking um, cigarettes as we, you know, the, a lot of attention was in educating about the negative impact of cigarettes. But cannabis use has increased over the years. Well, I would also put that vaping is a thing that we have to pay attention to because vaping of nicotine has gone up and so now um, vaping of marijuana. But um, a lot of teens don't think that there's anything um, wrong anyway, and so it's a, not wrong, but in terms of having a negative impact potentially on the brain. So well, don't know why that came back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so one of the things that uh, um, is known is that there are long-term effects of adolescent exposure have been studied for a while in terms of psychiatric vulnerability, and it's been shown that cannabis consumption, for example, and in, in during um, teenage and young adults, pre pre was really significantly associated with later risk of schizophrenia that, that obviously has a genetic um, link as well. But many studies have shown that there, the increased frequency of use of cannabis does um, increase um, not only um, psychosis risk, um, suicide attempts, the use of other illicit drugs, and so on. So again, if we go through our animal models, what can we, what do we see? So we see that similar to what we had seen with prenatal exposure to THC and probably even more, that adolescent exposure to THC, um, the animals would self-administer more heroin. Um, there are nuances there, just like in humans, in terms of genetics and behavioral traits, in terms of you know um, which animals will self-administer more. But in general, we see this increase. We've been looking into aspects of um, you know what other behaviors do we see associated with adolescent THC exposure? And my postdoc Jacqueline Ferlin um, has been studying social interaction, social stress, and and different aspects of reward sensitivity. Um, in looking at this, we see um, that indeed adult animals with um, adolescent THC exposure so show decreases, for example, in social interaction. And it's very specific to social interactions because they don't show any difference in interactions with a novel object, for example. And the thing that's, um, and this is looking at reward sensitivity, um, follow, I'm sorry. So when you look, we're looking at reward sensitivity following a, um, social isolation, for example, to look at what does social isolation stress do? And after a social isolation, 
one night, for example, um, overnight without your, their buddies, um, these animals will self-administer um, uh, more. This is a, a chocolate reward, for example. And again, it's specific to the reward because their inactive lever where they're not getting a reward is not changed. One of the things that we see that these stress-related behaviors, it's like, okay, um, is there something obviously with uh, this, um, their um, HBA axis? And one of the things that we could see that 95 days after their adolescent exposure to THC, especially with high um, exposure THC, their court levels, their corticosterone levels are still elevated. Jacqueline also looked at impulsivity, and I'm not going to go through all the behaviors that she looked at, but here, for example, decision-making and gambling tasks, the rat gambling tasks, we could see that when um, animals were exposed to adolescents, um, different doses again, um, and then they were given an acute exposure of THC. And we didn't see any difference with I mean, the animals that had been given vehicle or a low dose. But in those that have been given a high dose of THC, they showed greater motor impulsivity when they were given again, re-exposed to THC. But a fascinating thing is that there was a persistent um, residual effect of just that re-exposure to THC. So days later, you could see that the animals who had actually gotten, never gotten THC and just had gotten that one exposure, um, both for the vehicle and then the low dose THC, they showed greater impulsivity compared to um, uh, the highest doses. Oops, sorry. So we, we know that um, not only does the adolescent exposure to THC last into adulthood in aspects of um, impulsivity, but with the highest doses that if you're exposed during adolescence, but even those who had a low exposure to THC and now get exposed, re-exposed to THC later, that can exacerbate um, their impulsivity behavior. So we go back to what are some of the neural um, correlates of that? And the prefrontal cortex is, as you know, um, really critical for a number of the behaviors I just showed. And the prefrontal cortex is one of the last regions of the brain to develop. Um, and so, you know, adolescence and into to young adulthood, it's not till about age, you know, mid twenties that the prefrontal cortex fully um, gain adult maturity. So in looking at the prefrontal cortex, I realized um, we looked at pyramidal cells in, in, in layer three, and we could see that um, one, we saw differences in synaptic plasticity of, of some of the, um, when we counted the synapses, but we can also see that there were changes in the complexity of these, um, of, of, of the pyramidal cells. And, and where we saw, th and where we saw the, the changes, um, and I realized that there's something I actually off with one of my slides, but where we saw some of the changes, we then wanted to go in and see we picked up the, the, the cells and looked and um, with laser capture microdissection and then sequenced them. And so what has changed? So when you looked at the pyramidal cells in terms of um, in, in adult animals with adolescent THC, we see the, in normal animals um, that you know, the, the systems that should be changed during adolescent development are changed. But in animals with adolescent THC, we see significant dysregulation of the dendritic, of the dendritic um, reorganization. We see profound changes in epigenetic um, related um, systems such as histone modification, chromatin modification. Interestingly, once again, we see KMT2A being associated with being the strongest functionally um, uh, altered epigenetic gene network in the adult animals with um, adolescent THC exposure. And the KMT2A has been, as, as I said, um, is a histone methyltransferase, but it's um, important for transcriptional memory and a regulator of morphogenesis. And importantly, it's been hypothesized to be involved in uh, schizophrenia-related cortical dysfunction. When we look at 
the coordination of how the, the genes that are involved in dendritic um, regulation in terms of involved in synaptic plasticity and epigenetic modifications, if you look at normal animals in the, the, in the pyramidal cells in the prefrontal cortex, there is not a huge um, relationship um, between these systems. However, in the adult animals that had adolescent THC, there's a complete reorganization, complete, so that there's now this really tight um, uh, interaction between these gene networks. Interestingly, the overlap between these, these differentially expressed genes um, were genes networks that we also saw dysregulated in the prefrontal cortex of individuals um, who had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Again, I'm not gonna show you um, all of uh, those, but it shows us that adolescent THC, it alters the structural development of the prefrontal cortex and in gene networks that are really relevant to psychiatric and addiction and risk. Again, I didn't go through all the issues of dosing makes a difference, the timing and re-exposure of cannabis makes a difference, and even behavioral traits, and there are things that we can talk about in the, the QA time. Um, as I said, I, I think, unfortunately, I'm going to, I had, um, this was our laser capture, I realized I put the two things there, and they came, it duplicated. And so I'm gonna just go past this. Okay. So, um, so how do we, you know, we say that we see that from the prenatal time period, we see impact of um, cannabis and THC well in the beginning of life from juvenile time periods during adolescence. We see that adolescent THC exposure um, impacts on adult behavior. And another important um, time period really relates to the next generation. So as I said, a masochistic perhaps, and you know, studying the, the developmental effects of cannabis, both in, in animal models and in humans is pretty challenging. And already looking at prenatal effects and adolescent effects, and, but, um, I, I, I guess I wanted to be even more masochistic. So we've been studying subsequent generations. And again, just because I, I wanted to make, um, to leave a lot more, more time for discussing um, um, a lot of our, 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 our work, I'm just gonna give you a general overview of like, you know, what we saw. So initially, people weren't studying the germline effects of drugs uh, when we started and we wanted to see could there be an impact? And so we used our typical uh, model that we had used for looking at, for example, adolescent exposure on adult behavior, which was um, we treat it as adolescents and then we, they grow into adulthood and they never see um, THC again. And here we let the, the mothers and fathers fall in love, and but we had other um, um, people raise their kids just to offset any potential impact of um, ma maternal, you know, THC exposure, changing their maternal behavior. And so we looked at the offspring behavior and their neurobiology. And so Henry Sutzeritz, um, um, one of the things that we could see very early um, was that there were significant changes in um, genes related to synaptic plasticity when we looked at um, our candidate gene list. And we could see electrophysiologically also that there were changes in, um, in, in, in um, the firing activity. Once again, long-term depression was changed. And we could also see epigenetically looking across the genome with DNA methylation, again, that a postsynaptic um, density network was the most significantly changed. But interestingly, when you look at gene expression, again, in an unbiased manner, the system that is significantly altered comes back to this aspect of um, histone trimethylation of histone um, of his, um, histone three H three K four, which is the KMT two A um, related um, gene. So it's not just only prenatal; it's not just only adolescence. There is something that's quite intriguing about this particular epigenetic. Um, uh, mechanism that we're we're following up on, trying to figure what's the it, how is THC impacting on that. Um, 
but I want to emphasize um, two things. Um, those we can see that adults, as I said, whose who, whose parents were exposed to THC as adolescents, still shows um, effect. But a true transgenerational effect is what happens to the future, even the F3 generation, the great grandkids. So these are the great grandkids. They've never, ever been exposed to THC. It was their uh, great grand, uh, here was their great grandfathers that were exposed. And they show significant differences in, for example, reward here, self-administering for um, positive, uh, um, chocolate and Initially, from day one, they show significant differences in their self-administration behavior, and and it's and it's and it's uh, very specific. So we see, like I said, increased reward sensitivity. Um, this was in males in in um, the F three generation. There are sex differences, and you know we can we can talk about that as well. So what we're working on now is trying to understand how does this happen. So it's not that you're striatal cells get um, get uh, uh, moved from one generation to the next. So we come back now to start to studying sperm. And we're looking into, you know, the mechanisms, as I said, that can allow for your experience with cannabis to be transmitted, not just, you know, to the next generation. And so what Greg Rampala and the postdoc has been looking at are um, the different um, RNAs in, in, in sperm, and we can see that there, well, there are different types of um, RNAs in, in, as a sperm um, develops um, from pi RNAs, micro RNAs, and so on. And so what Greg did was to, when we, when we sequenced uh, the sperm, we could see that there are significant changes in the small um, non-coding RNAs and primarily in these micro RNAs. And he could identify which specific micro RNAs um, are being impacted by the THC. And again, this is THC exposure of, you know, um, earlier in, in life. And we can, he can also see, you know, when the looking at different part, what the development of, of the sperm. Importantly, um, so this is a saying in terms of this is the, the, the caudus epididymis with the mature sperm. So you see the changes in microRNAs and it's not there in the, um, in the immature sperm. So we know where the changes are occurring. Um, importantly, um, the question is, you know, I, as I said, how is it doing that? So we can see that what is happening is that it's being, it's, um, the THC is impacting on the epididymisomes these extracellular vesicles as the sperm is it moves um, uh, move, is moved along. So we can see that if we um, these extracellular vesicles, they're contributing to the final sperm maturation and they traffic the small RNAs to the sperm. And so this is where we see where the, the, the THC effects in these um, um, the extracellular um, epididymisomes <laughs> that is impacting. So we know that germline THC alters the epigenetic signature and the behaviors in their unexposed offspring that we can see now extends across multiple generations and the mechanisms might um, uh, be due to these, uh, well, we can come to in terms of these extracellular vesicles that then um, changes the small microRNAs that are trafficked into the sperm. So does adolescent, does developmental THC exposure impact, um, have a long-term impact? Absolutely. We see it from the prenatal um, that we can track along their lifetime and we can even see it across generations. And a number of the behaviors that we see and now in our, our human studies, we can see that it's impacting on, on behaviors such as anxiety and so on, um, early in life, and that's usually predictive of, like I said, psychiatric risk um, later. We are identifying um, a number of the epigenetic mechanisms that are contributing to this using our animal models, but it keeps coming back down to aspects of um, uh, changes in synaptic plasticity in these systems that are important for, um, as I said, 
um, elevating psychiatric risk. And an important new line for us is really looking at this interface between stress, cannabis stress and the immune system, because we see this come up um, repeatedly, even in our animal models that I, I didn't show those results just because of time, but that's a system that we're, we're looking at in terms of this interface of the three, the endocannabinoid, the stress and immune system in maintaining these long-term effects. So these are some of the people who contributed really um, a large part of the top row that showed a lot of their work, Henrietta from the um, cross-generational effects in, in, together, um, as well as with Greg, and Greg um, also contributes a lot to the prenatal human studies and Anissa with the um, prenatal rat models and Jackie with um, the adolescent models. And she runs a lot of uh, um, behavioral decision-making tasks that takes months and I tell her not to do it, but she still does it anyway. And it's great because it's been giving us a lot of great information. And I have to say, you know, I'm so honored um, to work with Yoko Nomura and her team, Lexi, Patricia, and Melissa, because studying the human, carrying out human studies are, especially developmental studies are quite, um, quite challenging. And um, her commitment to, um, to her, her team and to the patients, not the patients, the study participants year after year, and um, thank the um, NIH for their support. And I will take any questions. Wow, what a roaring crowd this is. Thank you, crowd. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a whole list of questions here. And um, if I stumble, guys, just, um, I'm gonna try to group them together by questioner. So going back to the beginning. So, th so there's several levels. So the questions about stress, early prenatal stress, and then um, questions about exposure to THC. And then specific questions about this methyltransferase and the, um, the degree to which the um, uh, expression effects are uh, generic versus specific. And then Anthony LaMancha has a, a series of what can only be considered scalpel questions. They're, uh, oh. they're, <laughs> no, they're, they're as usual, they're excellent questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it in that order if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So the first is from uh, Cora Carmen Esparza. Uh, how did you control? that women used in distressed group after the hurricanes were sufficiently stressed? Was there a way to gauge this or read this out? So um, there are, you know, there's a, there, we, there are a lot of stress questionnaires and um, that, and, and women, um, uh, we carried out a battery of tests, both in looking at the psychological tasks, um, behavioral tasks, in regard to you know even their their own depression their own anxiety all of these things and including um, it's like a called a PTSD um, uh, 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 measurement and so um, we use that I don't know if that is really really does capture um, even you know that's obviously capturing the extreme end but there the, the thing that's important about the study is that there are women that were pregnant during Sandy Storm. There were women that had just had babies um, uh, before Sandy Storm and after. So actually our comparison are women that, and their kids that are exposed to Sandy, but at different time periods. So mm -hmm. this, is, this shows that depending on when the stress occurs, and this is the prenatal stress, there's a difference. Right. And let me, uh, those were big numbers too, if I remember the slide, right? You had pretty large number of, uh... Yeah, so behaviorally, yeah, and I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, like I said, Yoko and her team, they work really hard. Clearly right. over the years, you know, you get dropout, but they really work hard to try and keep the, the study participants in, in, in the study. Okay, uh, next one's from Anthony La Mancha. Uh, does the apparent targeting of cannabinoid effects on the basal forebrain during early gestation influence GABAergic neuronal migration to the cortex? and potentially development and function of inhibitory networks in the cortex? Phenomenal question. And we are actually studying that in, in, um, now because we also see in our, in our adolescent exposure, when we, we do, for example, RNA scope and we're doing like some single cell work and we see that um, the reduction of the cannabinoid receptor is actually specific to those GABAergic cells. 
so we're now going back and looking at exactly to your question that it's dysregulating that inhibitory right. network. I think that's a critical question in the sense that um, there are a whole bunch of epigenetic effects claims. Some of them yours here in addiction. Uh, Carrie Ressler, for example, um, at Harvard has results that almost seem unbelievable sometimes that crossing generations, okay? Um, however, you can imagine in the kinds of assays used, just taking inhibition down a bit would make an animal under or overreactive to things. It might make it learn quicker or slower. And um, um, it's important for us as scientists to keep in mind, it could be very generic changes in the learning apparatus that's there and the sort of balance of excitation inhibition. So that's a great question. Yeah, completely. Okay. Steph, uh, next one's from Stephanie DeLuca. Have you measured early adverse events the first few years in the children exposed to cannabis prenatally to confirm if AE, what is an AE? Adverse, adverse, event, yeah. adverse events might be a moderator variable between exposure and some of the behavioral outcomes like anxiety. So, you know, um, from six months old when, the, when they started to study the kids, they showed, then you study, you're looking at temperament. Um, and even then the kids already at six months old showed difference in temperament on the more on the distress, which you know, translates later to anxiety. So yes, I mean, it's pretty early. Um, you know, that's a good question in the, in the context of if we use early, the earliest measures to see how much they, how well they mediate or, I mean, I think that they drive, I think it's this, it's just this, the trajectory. So it's showing that they're there from early and that, you know, they're just, they're the trajectory into anxiety. It's, it's, it's probably one trajectory, yeah. Huh. Okay, there a, one, two, three, okay. Um, this is from Shaga Navapur. Um, great talk, Thank exclamation you. mark. Uh, <laughs> what region of the brain did you check for the H3K, what's that, the histone three lysine? Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, 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 yeah, the yeah, histomethylation of lysine 4. So we've right. mainly um, focused on the striatum, um, uh, dorsal and ventral, primarily the, the biggest, the most, the most of our studies are it's in the nucleus accumbens and even the core of the accumbens, I will be, I will be honest, um, in terms of, you know, the, the discrete region. We had looked in a number of other areas early when my students had started and we didn't see a, a similar change in, I think it, then it was, I'm, actually I won't even say because I, I don't want to say something wrong, but it's not that every, it, it was changed everywhere. So, okay. but we focus on the striatum. It's a, um, this is a follow-up also from Shaga. Uh, it's a common epigenetic mark involved in genes transcription and many behaviors like memory. So how can you know the specific role of the marker in regard to TH, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol exposure? I completely agree. I mean, it is, an, you know, it is a, an important regulator of transcriptional memory and learning and behavior, like you said. So, you know, that's why we go in and we um, knock it out, overexpress in, in different parts of the behavioral, um, of the behavior being studied. So we haven't looked at acquisition, we actually don't see that there was this huge difference in acquisition of the number of the behaviors that, that we study. We see more, it's like when they're stressed, you start to, you start to see the differences in, in, in the behaviors that you're looking at. When we had knocked it out in the accumbens, we studied motivated behavior. They'd already learned, they were already there. So it wasn't about learning, but I'm, I'm sure there are different behaviors where that aspect of learning um, comes into play. But I agree with you, you know, one of the things that people, um, we do all these um, quote unquote reward tasks and these reward tasks um, all have to deal with learning. So, you know, there's an aspect of learning that comes into all of these things, no matter if we, we wanna say that, you know, we're looking at reward. Yeah, it's um, the learning tasks are, um... The learning tests are often a little bit blunt in terms of maybe dissecting out the kinds of things you're touching on with the molecular manipulations. Um, the next one is from Sarika Srivastava, um, my colleague here. Um, does KMT2A knockdown pre prevent the effect of THC exposure in mice? Knockdown, sorry. Does it prevent the 
the, the effects the effects of early THC exposure in mice. So it prevents the we sort of mainly like the reward related motivation and so on. So it, right. it 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 normalizes that. It normalizes it. But we haven't looked at prevention yet. Right. We haven't looked at prevention. We have just looked at um, as similar to the question before. Um, you know, once they have learned, can you reverse things? Right. I'm going to jump to. I'm not skipping you, Anthony. I'm jumping to Will Craft and Omna's questions and I'm gonna come back. Um, this is from Will, uh, Will Craft. Uh, are there cannabinoids other than THC and CBD that are of significant interest? Absolutely. You know, um, I always say the cannabinoid um, plan has over 140 cannabinoids and we focus a lot on THC and then we started studying CBD. So probably some of you know, some of our research relates to you know, um, CBD, and we actually see the opposite effects to like with THC. So we see CBD reduces um, uh, heroin seeking behavior. And then we carried out clinical trials and, sh and we're able to replicate that. And now we're carrying out a, a much larger trial, uh, double blinded uh, placebo control study to really see if that's true. Um, there are a number of other cannabinoids that people are studying now that have relevance to learning and memory um, that, you know, so we'll see how those studies go, but I've decided that I'm stopping because my, my brain is already exploding with all the things I study. So I'm not going to go, uh, study a lot of the other cannabinoids, but definitely CBN, oh, a number of, of cannabinoids are, are now being investigated, even though they're very low in concentration in the cannabis that's out there on, on, on the streets. Well, they're low in general to start, um, but people are now, um, looking at, into them. Um, and this is from uh, Amna Elta here. Fantastic talk, exclamation mark. Uh, how do the biological effects of, and this is related, to uh, prenatal, can, prenatal cannabis exposure compared to inhaling other substances like nicotine, for example? So, I mean, in terms of just, you know, the neurobiological systems or... or... I, I, my, okay, the, um, I will uh, imagine what she's thinking. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what, you know, does there's do similar kinds of things happen with smoking cigarettes? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you do know, you decorate your DNA, get effects on progeny, maybe get effects on, okay. Absolutely. So, I mean, there may be, um, there's specificity to some of the pharmacological actions of where nicotinic receptors and cannabinoid receptors, but there's clearly an overlap of a number of neural systems. And as Reed just said, you know, you see prenatal effects of nicotine. Um, perhaps they may not be, um, you see transgenerational effects now that people are beginning to show, you know, that replicates. So it emphasizes that exposure, environmental, uh, and environmental stress, not just drugs, the environment impacts on, you know, neurodevelopmental processes by changing to me, at least I think, you know, fundamental systems, like I showed in aspects of, you know, the stress, glucocorticoid, immune, that then can impact on, um, we've not studied the um, ovaries, we've mainly, uh, you know, studied, and eggs, we, we've mainly studied the, the, the um, male tran tran transmission, but in terms of can it impact on sperm, even into the next generation. So, is it that it's the cannabinoid receptors in the accumbens that mediates the, the things across generation? No. And it is to me changing fundamental biological systems that yes, interplay with nicotinic, nicotinic receptors, that interplay with cannabinoid receptors, that interplay with opioid receptors. So, you know, so I do think that many drugs as well as, you know, environmental toxins, the stresses that we all go through can have long lasting impact. But the important thing I wanna emphasize and probably didn't emphasize enough about epigenetics, epigenetic mechanisms can mediate these long-term effects but epigenetics are reversible. So there are things that can happen during your lifetime that can reverse the things that you might've inherited or you could have inherited in part from your grandfather, from your father, your grandfather, but because you live in a more enriched environment, you counter those epigenetic changes. So it doesn't mean that everybody's gonna all of a sudden now, you know, start having psychiatric illnesses, but we, we do know that 
you know, because epigenetics are reversible, I think that that's the positive things of the results that we have. I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. I'm not, this is from Anthony um, La Mancha, where the THC effects on maternal behavior, licking, grooming, arching for nursing, question mark. And yeah. then, his, wait, then his follow up is, could this be influenced by methylation changes due to stress as suggested previously enhanced by THC exposure? So one of the reasons that we don't allow um, the, the moms to, who, are, who receive THC to raise their own, we mix the litters with both vehicle exposed and THC exposed and somebody right. else raises her kids because we wanna to try to take away the maternal impact. Um, one of my postdocs, Anissa Barra, she has studied maternal effects of THC in her previous lab and didn't see huge differences in that, but still we wanted to be cautious and we didn't, um, we, we, we let somebody else we cross foster. Okay. Um, sorry to the rest of them. I'm going to ask my question now. And <laughs> I think probably it's going to be the end of it. Oh, no. So I, goodness, it's really, um, there's a lot of interest here. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to just back up a little bit and, and just address this whole. So what you have shown is there's a whole lot of decorating of the DNA that goes on in response to environmental events and or the stimulation of receptor pathways or whatnot, um, that would have been common through the ages, right? So, I mean, we all study, you know, we all read Darwin chapter one through chapter 12, uh, evolution by natural selection. So all of a sudden now there's this whole uh, menu of options that are kind of Lamarckian in a way. They're, they're specifically tuned to the experiences you're having now they build in some change. And now we're seeing that some of these changes make it way through to the next generation. Maybe it dies out over the next few generations as a kind of transient signal, but it does change the game a little bit. And it particularly changes the game in high density cultures that we live in now. So do you think maybe in the sense that you're exposed to things, uh, there's a, uh, kind of meme contagion, you know, you take one drug, you manufacture, okay, so in other words, humans can, are now affecting themselves in ways that we have a hard time understanding what it's doing to our genes and our, we're not, we didn't stop evolving because we live in culture. Exactly. So, yeah. That's you see this yeah. as a movement that's just modif it's modifying our bigger view of evolution. Absolutely, um, I, I come, absolutely, you know, one of the things I, we are still evolving. It's not that because we have an iPhone and we have all this, we are still evolving. And this time in our society, the, I do think that this um, societal stresses are huge. I think that they're, you know, obviously every time during evolution, there's been some huge stress. It's not that our, this generation is unique, but there's, but it's now compounded with more drugs. It's now compounded with more environmental toxins. It's now compounded with all these other things that perhaps previous generations didn't have. And they do transmit to the next generations. Right. The, so, you know, this is one way, epigenetics to me, when I think of big picture is, you know, gen, to change your genetics, we're talking thousands of years, but your, your, immediate ancestors can tell you about the environment through epigenetics. So this is a way to inform the next generations in a quicker manner. Sometimes, you know, like people who in Europe, when there's a famine and they passed on to their next kids and their grandkids, but their grandkids lived in now a very fat world. So they now get more obese but because they're the epigenetic mechanisms that were changed due to their grandparents' famine. So even though their grandparents tried to help them through this epigenetic information with us transfer. So I do think that epigenetics has a bigger picture to how our experiences collectively and individually gets to the next generation to quote unquote, help them or protect them. And, um, but, I do think that drugs and all these environmental things are much bigger load than perhaps previous uh, generations. I, I agree with that. I, I actually would add one following thought, which is the thing that can happen now that never happened before is this absolute synchronicity because of the communication networks of stressors. 
Now, all of a sudden, you're not isolated. Instead of just having a, a village stressed because a fire happened, you stress millions and millions of people literally simultaneously and, inje- you know, injecting potential changes into their genome. So I just think it's a, it's an interesting set of problems that are coming in the next few hundred years. And Absolutely. These are Absolutely. tools to study it. So can we um, thank the speaker again with our um, fantastic uh, applause? Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. Thanks again for coming. And it it was very good. I'm really glad. And you can send me questions, you know, that we weren't able to address uh, during this time. Thanks again for inviting me. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Bye.